Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering Spark Summit 2017. Brought to you by Databricks. Hi, we're back here where theCUBE is live and I didn't even know it. Welcome, we're at Spark Summit 2017. Having so much fun talking to our guests, I didn't know the camera was on. Uh, we are going to talk with uh, Cloudera, a couple of experts that we have here. The first is Mark Grover, who's a software engineer and an author. He wrote the book, Hadoop Application Architectures. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, glad to be here. And just to his left, we also have Jennifer Wu, and Jennifer's the Director of Product Management at Cloudera. Did I get that right? That's right, I'm happy to be here too. All right, great to have you. Why don't we get started, talk a little bit more about uh, what Cloudera is maybe introducing new at the show. I saw you had a booth over here. Mark, do you want to get started? Hi, yeah, there are two exciting things that we've launched recently. Um, there's Cloudera Altus, which uh, is for transient workloads and being able to do ETL-like workloads, and Jennifer will be, uh, will be happy to talk more about that. Mm -hmm. And then there's Cloudera Data Science Workbench, which is uh, this tool that allows uh, folks to use data science at scale. So mm -hmm. uh, get away from doing data science in silos on your personal laptops and do it in a secure environment mm -hmm. on-prem and on-cloud. All right, well, uh, let's jump into Data Science Workbench first. Tell me a little bit more about that, and, uh, and you mentioned it's for exploratory data science, so give us a little more detail on, on what it does. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, there was a private beta for Cloud Air Data Science Workbench earlier in the year, and then it was made GA uh, not, uh, a few months ago. Uh, and it's, like you said, an exploratory data science tool that brings data science to the masses within the enterprise. Uh, previously, people used to have, there was this dichotomy, right? As a data scientist, I want to have the latest and greatest tools. I want to use the latest version of Python, the latest uh, notebook kernel, and I want to be able to use R and Python to be able to crunch this data and run my models in machine learning. However, on the other side of this dichotomy were the IT organization of the org of the organization where they want to make sure that all tools are compliant and that your clusters are secure and your data is not going into places that are not secured by state-of-the-art security solutions like Kerberos, for example, right? And of course, if the data scientists are putting the data on their laptops and taking that laptop around to wherever they go, that's not really a solution. Mm -hmm. So that was one problem. And the other one was, if you were to bring them all together in the same solution, Data scientists have different requirements. One may want to use Python 2.6, and the other one would be want to use 3.2, right? And so uh, Cloudera Data Science Workbench is a new pro product that allows data scientists to uh, visualize and do machine learning uh, through this very nice notebook-like interface, share their work with the rest of the colleagues in the organization, and but also allows you to keep your cluster secure. So it allows you to run against a Kerberos cluster, allows single sign-on to your web app, uh, web interface to the data science workbench, and provides a really nice developer experience in the sense that my workflow and my tools and my version of Python does not conflict with Jennifer's version of Python. We all have our own uh, Docker and, Ker and Kubernetes-based infrastructure that makes sure that we use the packages that we need and they don't interfere with each other. We, okay. with each other. We're going to go to Jennifer and Altus in just a few minutes, but uh, George, first give you a chance to maybe uh, dig in on uh, data science workshop. Two questions on the data science side. Some of the really toughest nuts to crack have been um, sort of a common environment for the collaborators, but also the ability to operationalize the models once you've sort of agreed on them and manage the life cycle across teams, you know, right. like challenge or champion, promote, promote something, or even before that, doing the A-B testing, right. um, and then sort of what's in production is typically in a different language from what, you know, was designed in, right. and sort of integrating it with the apps. Um, where is that on, on the roadmap? Because no, no one really has a good answer for that. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, in general, I think it's, it's the problem to crack these days of how do you productionalize something that was written by a data scientist in a notebook-like system onto the production cluster, right? And I think the part where the data scientist works in a different language than the language that's in production, I think that problem 
the best I can say right now is to actually have someone rewrite that. I don't really have someone rewrite that in the language you're going to make in production, mm -hmm. right? But I, I don't see that to be the more common part. I think the widespread problem is, even when the language is production, how do you go making uh, the part that the data scientist wrote, the model, or whatever that would be, into a production cluster? And so, data science work mentioned in particular runs on the same cluster uh, that is being managed by Cloud App Manager, right? So this is a tool that you install, but that is available to you as a web server, as a web interface. And so that allows you to move your uh, development machine learning algorithms from uh, your data science workbench to production much more easier because it's all running on the same hardware and same systems. There's no separate Cloud App Manager instance you had to use to manage the workbench compared to your actual cluster. Okay, um, a tangential question, but one of the, the difficulties of, of doing machine learning is finding all the training data and, and sort of the data science expertise to sit with the domain expert to you know, figure out proper model, the features, things like that. Um, one of the things we've seen so far from the cloud vendors is they take their huge data sets in terms of voice you know, images, they do the natural language understanding, um, speech, uh, or rather text to speech, um, you know, facial recognition, because they have such huge data sets they can train on. Um, we're hearing noises that they're going to take that down to the more mundane statistical kind of machine learning algorithms, so that you wouldn't be like, here's a algorithm to do churn, you know, go to town, mm -hmm. but that they might have something that's already kind of pre-populated that you would just customize. Is that something that you guys would tackle too? I can't speak for the roadmap in that sense, but I think some of that problem needs to be tackled by projects like Spark, for example. So I think as the stack matures, it's going to raise the level of abstraction uh, as time goes on. Uh, and I think whatever benefits uh, Spark ecosystem will have will come directly to distributions like Cloudera. That's interesting, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, well let's go to Jennifer now and talk about Altus a little bit. Now you've been on theCUBE show before, right? I have not. I it, no, okay, yeah. well familiar with your work. Uh, tell us, you're the, the product manager for uh, Altus. What does it do and what was the motivation to build it? Yeah, we're really excited about Cloudera Altus. So we released Cloudera Altus in its first GA form in, in April, and we launched Cloudera Altus in a public uh, environment in Strata London about two weeks ago. So we're really excited about this, and we are very excited to now open this up to all of the customer base. Um, and what it is is a platform as a service offering uh, designed to uh, leverage basically the agility and the scale of cloud um, and make a very easy to use type of experience to expose Cloudera capacity for, in particular, for data engineering type of workloads. So uh, the end user will be able to uh, very easy in a very agile manner get uh, data engineering capacity on Cloudera in the cloud and they'll be able to do things like ETL and large scale data processing, um, productionized uh, machine learning workflows uh, in the cloud with this, with this new data engineering as a service experience. And we wanted to abstract away the cloud and cluster operations and make the uh, end user a really, um, the end user experience very easy. So jobs and workloads as first class objects. So you can do things like submit jobs, um, clone jobs, terminate jobs, troubleshoot jobs. We wanted to make this very, very easy for the uh, data engineering end user. Mm -hmm. um, this, it's, it does sound like you sort of abstracted away a lot of the infrastructure that you would associate with on-prem and sort of almost make it like programmable and invisible. But um, I guess my, one of my questions is um, when you put it in, in a cloud environment, when you're on-prem you have a certain set of competitors which is kind of restrictive because you are the standalone platform. But when you go in the cloud, someone might say, I, I want to use Redshift on Amazon or, or Snowflake you know, as the um, MPP SQL database at the end of the pipeline. And, and it's not just, I'm using those as examples. Yes. There's you know, dozens, hundreds, thousands of other services to choose from. Yes. What happens to the 
integrity of that platform if someone carves off one piece? Right, so um, interoperability and a unified uh, data pipeline is very important to us. So we want to make sure that we can still service the entire data pipeline all the way from ingest and data processing to analytics. So our team has 24 different open source components that we, uh, that we deliver in the CDH distribution and we have committers across the entire stack. Uh, we know the application and we want to make sure that everything's interoperable no matter how you deploy the clusters. So if you've deployed data engineering clusters through uh, Cloudera Altus, but you've deployed Impala clusters for a data mart in the cloud through uh, Cloudera Director or through any other format, we want all these clusters to be interoperable and we've taken great pains in order to make everything work together well. Okay. So, so how do Altus and Data Science Workbench interoperate with Spark? Maybe, sorry, do you want to go first for Altus? Sure, so um, we, in terms of interoperability, we focus on things like making sure there are no data silos so that um, the data that you use for your entire data lake can be consumed by the different components in our system, the different compute engines and different tools. And so if you're processing data, you can also um, look at this data and visualize this data through data science workbench. So after you do uh, data ingestion and data processing, you can use any of the other analytic tools um, and then and this includes data science workbench. Right, and for Data Science Workbench, it runs, uh, for example, uh, with the latest version of Spark, you could pick uh, the currently latest release version of Spark, uh, is Spark 2.1, Spark 2.2 is being voted, of course, and that will still be, soon be integrated after it's released. For example, you could use Data Science Workbench with your flavor of Spark 2's version, and you can run PySpark or Scala jobs on this notebook-like interface, be able to share your work. And because you're using Spark underneath the hood, it uses Yarn for resource manager management, um, the data science workbench itself uses Docker for configuration management uh, and Kubernetes for resource managing these Docker containers. What would be, if, if you had to describe sort of the edge conditions um, and, and the sweet spot of the applications, I mean, you, you talked about data engineering. Um, one thing we were, we were talking to Matei and, uh, Matei Zahari and, and Reynolds Shin about was, um, and, and Ali Gotsi as well, was if you put Spark on a database, or at least a you know, sophisticated storage manager like Kudu, all of a sudden there are a whole new class of jobs or, or applications that open up. Have you guys thought about what that might look like in the future and, and what new applications you would tackle? I think a lot of that benefit, for example, could be coming from the underlying storage engine. So let's take yeah. Spark on Kudu, for example. Yeah. Um, the inherent characteristics of Kudu today allow you to do updates without having to either deal with the complexity of something like HBase or the crappy performance of dealing HDFS compactions, right? So the sweet spot comes from Kudu's capabilities. Uh, of course, it doesn't support transactions or anything like that today, but imagine now putting something um, like Spark and being able to use the machine learning libraries, and uh, we have been limited so far in the machine learning algorithms we have implemented in Spark by the storage system sometimes. And for example, new machine learning algorithms and or the, or the existing ones could be rewritten uh, to make use of the update features, for example, in Kudu. And so it sounds like it makes it, the, the machine learning pipeline might get richer, but I'm, I'm not hearing that, um, and maybe this isn't sort of in the near term sort of roadmap, the idea that you would build sort of operational apps that have these sophisticated analytics built in. You know, where, where the analytics, um, you've done the training, but at, at runtime, you know, the inferencing influences a transaction, influences a decision. Is that something I, that you would foresee? I think that's totally possible. Um, again, at the core of it is the part that now you have one storage system that can do scans really well, and it can also do random reads and writes right. in place, right? So as you're, and so that allows applications which were previously siloed because you had one application that ran, ran off of HDFS and another application that ran out of HBase. Right. And then perhaps, yeah, and so you had to correlate them to just being one single application that can use to train and then also use the trained data to then make decisions on 
on the new transactions that come in. So that's very much within the sort of scope of imagination or scope, that's part of the sort of the ultimate plan. I think it's definitely conceivable now, yeah. Okay. All right, we're up against a hard break coming up in just a minute, so you each get a 30 second answer here, but it's the same question. You've been here for a day and a half now. What's the most surprising thing you've learned that you think should be shared more broadly with the Spark community? Let's start with you. I think uh, one of the great things that happening in Spark today is people have been complaining about latency for a long time. So if you saw the keynote yesterday, you would see that Spark is making forays into reducing that latency. And if you are interested in Spark, using Spark, uh, it's a very exciting news. You should keep tabs on it, and we hope to deliver lower latency uh, as a community sooner. How long is one millisecond? <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm, I'm largely focused on uh, cloud infrastructure and I found um, here at the, um, at the conference that uh, like many, many people are very much prepared to actually start taking more, um, you know, more POCs and more, um, more interest in cloud and uh, the response in terms of all of this and Altus is, is very, has been very encouraging. Yeah. Great, well Jennifer, Mark, uh, thank you so much for spending some time here on theCUBE with us today. We're going to come by your booth and chat a little bit more later because it's some interesting stuff. And, and thank you all for watching theCUBE today here at Spark Summit 2017. And thanks to Cladera for bringing us these two experts. And thank you for watching. We'll see you again in just a few minutes with our next interview. <laughs>